here. So um, you have a unique opportunity here because I've asked the speakers to really focus on the infrastructure that the new technologies will get inserted into. What you have here are people that practically day to day have to be dealing with water, and they understand the issues are bigger than just an innovative technology. And so I'm hoping that they'll be able to focus on that and that uh, you direct your questions that way and that'll help everyone. I'm gonna, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna introduce everybody at once. And um, um, first to speak will be, uh, let's see, okay, uh, Adam Tank, who's the CEO of Industrial Optics and Advisor G Water Investment Team. Uh, then yeah, he has a presentation, so that, that's up. Is that up? Then we'll have Scott Mitchell from Anadarka. <coughs> Uh, and then Jeff Hansen from Texas Instrument and Chris Chen from the city of Austin. Again, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask each one of them to spend a few minutes uh, explaining their organization and where it is at this point in time, because some of them, like GE and Anadarko, are evolving very rapidly. Um, others are dealing with the uh, issues around uh, the changing demographics of water as we move from the arid cycle now to uh, uh, rainy cycle. And, uh, and then we'll open it up for questions after everyone's done making their comments. Hey, everybody. That's heavy talk. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like the love these men on Earth Day because Richard told me I was speaking last night, and today is actually my birthday. So that was the best gift you could have given to me, in addition to the fact that I got thrown my cowboy boots and I was born in Texas. So I feel pretty special today, which is great. And hopefully I can give you guys a gift of a wonderful presentation and a beautiful picture of Kevin Costner. But I will tell you that I am Adam Tank. For the last two years, I've spent my life working at GE Water. I'm having a bit of an identity crisis because we just got bought by Suez. And I also happened to win an internal entrepreneurship competition that GE put on late last year. They took 150 ideas from anyone in the company, and they said, if you win, you get to move to San Francisco and start a small business, and we'll fund it. So I won. And what I'm working on is actually water technology, of all things. So I've gotten to see things from two sides of the table. One is my GE Water investor hat, and I'm, I can certainly speak to what it means for technology in the water sector and where I think small companies and technology firms should be playing. And then the other hat I have is the entrepreneur hat that I've been playing for the last seven months, trying to fight as a technology innovator, selling into water utilities and playing that side of the table too. So I can speak to both worlds a bit. What I'll tell you right now is that business case is key. And that's what Trevor talked about last speech, Christina brought it up before in her speech. If you don't have a solid business case, you're not going to win any plain and simple. And unfortunately, when I was at GE Water Investment, a lot of the companies that we were doing diligence on didn't have a solid business case. Great technology, really fascinating work, but if you stand up in front of the utility and you can't tell them, this is how much money you're going to save, this is how much you will make, this is how we actually deploy the technology, here's the ecosystem for it, here's how it fits into the broader scheme, they don't buy it. Plain and simple. I think the appetite is there, I think the finance is there, I think the, uh, the interest is certainly there, but we as, and me, myself now as an entrepreneur, have to do a better job of selling a proper business case. So I'm going to give you a quick, uh, quick run through of what I've been up to and see what you guys can say about it. We're going to run through really quick. If you graduated from kindergarten, you know the water cycle. You also know that water is ultra scarce. So in the world of water infrastructure, if you know there's this key theme of the fact that water is scarce and that, it's, that the ecosystem is, is certainly fragile and fragmented, there are certain ways you can inject businesses and technology into different sectors to have it make sense for you and your business. A bunch of water is lost every day. We mentioned inside the fence, wastewater treatment facility, where Trevor's working on back office. And then you have the other side, which is the distribution and typing. And if you talk to any utility, and I spoke to probably 100 of them at GE, they all said that it's fine to have data software solutions, it's fine to have more insight into our processes, but one of our biggest challenges is the fact that our biggest asset, one of them, our pipes and our distribution system, is breaking and cracking. And unfortunately, more data can help reduce the cost to repair or replace by a bit, 
but it still costs a whole bunch of money to go and dig up a street at the end of the day. And so if you're a technology provider, think about if you're providing data, where it fits in with the ecosystem of the overall utility, either treatment, distribution, back office, whatever it is. And think about what part of the ecosystem that you're playing and where your business case is for that. So water systems are really old. They used to be made out of wood. Crazy cool graphs. If for your engineers out there, you can see uh, what types of material has been built over time, what we used in water distribution. And what you come to find is that in the business case, in the business, like when I'm as an entrepreneur now thinking about how I sell the utilities, I didn't come to them with a the technology and say, will you buy it? Instead, I asked them, where's your biggest expense and how can we reduce that? And by and large, the utilities came back to me and they said, no one's talking about four to eight inch pipes. No one's talking about the metallics, with the exception of cast iron. And if you're gonna target anything, that's what you should be targeting. And it turns out that the data actually backs that up. So 60 plus percent of all pipes in the United States are four to eight inch. Cast iron is the one that's corroding most frequently for obvious reasons, right? That's what's leaking the most. So you can quickly build a business case and figure out where the ecosystem may play. So Colorado Springs just removed 129 year old working water valve about a month or two ago. And then Philly actually just unearthed a 205 year old wooden water pipe. So it's ultra, ultra, ultra old. Right, and that's not changing. Every utility deals with the same challenges with aging infrastructure, and again, it's ultra expensive to try to fix it. So they're leaking, they're leaking, their, uh, they have a bunch of water where I live now in San Francisco. Oakland, San Francisco, the overall Bay Area has these challenges, and they're all saying like, we have teams of people trying to solve these, we're spending way too much money doing this, how can we stop spending, bleeding all this cash, right? Cash that we, is, is quickly diminishing, as Joe mentioned, right? They just don't have the cash that's so here's an example of technology that has existed for years and years and years and years and years, right? And there are plenty of companies out there that are doing advanced leak detection technologies. But for whatever reason, not every utility is using these technologies, right? They literally have been around for 50, 60, 70, 80 years, and they haven't changed that much. There is some, and I'll talk about it, right? But you guys know the fundamentals of some of the leaks and stuff. But you still have people walking around listening for leaks in the streets. So it's not the technology that's the barrier to adoption, it's something else, because this technology has been around forever. You have people that do more advanced that have acoustic sensors that are now listening permanently to infrastructure. You have companies that are using satellite telemetry and data to find leaks underground without having to dig up streets. Um, you have companies building really crazy snake robots of your nightmares that uh, also try to find leaks, right? But the problem is, imagine going to a doctor and them saying, we have all your blood samples back, we have all your test results, and we think that you have an issue with this. Good luck. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's what a lot of entrepreneurs are doing. And that's where, when I started this business, I figured, I found that I can't do that. I have to find out what, what the actual value at the end of the day that we're, we're, we're creating for utilities. So, this is actually the technical <laughs> But if you identify a leak, either from the surface or from satellite data or whatever else it is, you're left with a couple of options. One of which is literally bur burying yourself on the ground, <laughs> wearing your cowboy boots. Uh, the other is bringing out significant extraction construction equipment. Um, and then you also have what we're using, which are fire hydrants, and basically performing arthroscopic surgery for water utilities. So what we've done, I'll pass that, what we've done is develop a robot that can deal with corrosion navigation and small damage pipes, we can, we've 3D printed a bunch of them, we took the 3D prints, we turned them into engineering models, we took the engineering models, built them into a physical product, and then we've been shoving it through pipes and working with local water utilities from day one before we even engineered the thing to be able to tell us, if you're going to build something, this is what you need to build, this is the price point that it needs to be at, and this is exactly the value that you need to provide with. Plain and simple. We didn't build the technology to, to, to go and try to sell. We basically sold it before we had built it. And I think that's a fundamental difference in when you look at the ecosystem of technology and infrastructure and water, think about that. So we built this robot, we set up a pipe, we found a bathtub in San Francisco, we cleaned it up uh, pretty wild, startup world, and then we built basically this technology that can repair pipes from the inside and patch them underwater. So, I won't go into all the details, it's pretty interesting, but basically you can detect a leak, you can patch it, you can confirm the patch is done, and then you can move on through the system. 
So I'm happy to talk to anyone here. Obviously, at the conference, I'm excited for questioning. If you're ever in San Francisco, please stop by. You can come to the office or to the Dog Patch Saloon, which is right around the corner, and we can have a drink. Looking forward to seeing the rest of the presentation.